Welcome to Jerusalem Studio. The Kurds, estimated at some 34 million people, primarily reside in an area spanning from western Iran to northern Iraq, from southern Turkey to northern Syria, and play a role in both regional conflicts as well as peaceful resolutions. During the course of today's program, we will discuss the ethnic group and their significance to the chaotic region. With us to do so are Professor Ofra Bangio, who is a research fellow at the Moshe Dayan Center at Tel Aviv University. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amil Oren, and Dr. Jonathan Spire, who, is, uh, who heads the Rubin Center and a fellow at the Middle East Forum. Welcome. Thank you. And I'd like to start with you, uh, Mr. Oren. When we're talking about the Kurds, of course, uh, it's an ethnic group with a lot of history, uh, a lot of key figures over many, many years, many, many centuries. Of course, the most famous one out of them is Salahuddin, the uniter of all Muslim uh, armies who came and conquered Jerusalem at the time and set in Damascus. That is also why this entire region is called Bilad al-Sham or the Levant. But uh, they have also more significance for today as a nation that doesn't have their home, nation, uh, home state, basically, and do play roles within various societies, various states, but not really key roles. Can you give us a little bit of an understanding on that? You mentioned that uh, there are some 34, or at least between 32 and 35 million Kurds in the region. The um, biggest number is in Turkey, perhaps uh, 16 or between 14 and 18 uh, million Kurds. And this is um, one out of uh, six or so uh, Turks altogether, a significant uh, number. You have some 6 million uh, Kurds in both Iraq and Iran. This is more than Lebanon or Jordan, just as an ethnic group. You have uh, a lot of diversity. The majority of Kurds are Sunni, but there are many who are Shiites or belong to some other uh, denominations. And of course, they have to choose between focusing on their regional autonomy in Iraq, which might become independent, or trying to get some cross-border nationhood, which of course is uh, threatening mostly Turkey. They also fight alongside the coalition in Syria against uh, ISIS, against uh, Daesh, and they have a lot of stake in the oil business in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of the, uh, on the plate for the uh, Kurds if they play their uh, cards right, they might use this opportunity to improve their standing to a point where they never had it because um, almost 100 years ago, they had some uh, minor autonomy in the Soviet Union of all places. There was for six years a sort of uh, a Soviet Kurdistan. But other than that, they never had any independent entity and perhaps we are approaching the time when they will have it. Professor Banjo, the reality at hand is actually threatening. Many countries, many regimes and governments are very worried by uh, this ethnic group because of their significant uh, uh, number of people on the one hand and also their capabilities when it comes to their military capabilities, also in Iraq, also in Syria. They're a growing group. Of course, they have also the PKK, an organization that has been conducting insurgency or acts of terror in Turkey and have been very uh, successful on their uh, perception when it comes to that, even though they've never succeeded in reaching anything by it. But at the same time, we see other groups as well that are very significant within their societies in Iran and in Iraq and have been growing. Can you give us a little bit of an understanding? Why do they not unify in order to really create one nation? There are a lot of uh, reasons why is it so, because from the very beginning they were divided in four countries and each in each country they developed their own entity or their own um, identity, which is different from the other states. So this is the, the beginning of this diversity. The other thing is that their interests are colliding because, for example, in Iraq, they are going to go for an independence. In Turkey, Öcalan, he's changed his mind. At, at, at the first, he wanted independence, but now he changed his mind. He's talking about something which is not really very clear. This is uh, the um, democratic autonomy. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the, the other thing. In Syria, 
we have another group which is more connected to Turkey, to the PKK, than Iraq. So here again you have a diversity and tension between the Kurds of Iraq and the Kurds of Syria or the Peshmerga and the YPG who are fighting on the ground. And that's why you don't uh, see this collaboration. But on the other hand, what I will uh, stress is that there is in interdependence in spite of everything and in spite of the fact that they were divided into four countries, there is interdependence and uh, Iraq is the center of all the others. You have the basis, all the other parties have bases in Iraq. The PKK have bases, uh, has bases in Iraq, the Syrians. At other, so it, uh, the Kurdistan of Iraq has become a kind of epicenter for all the Kurds, and this in spite of the division and the, you know, the um, kind of um, different ideology between all the parties. Mm. Dr. Speyer, you have visited uh, the Kurds both in Syria and Iraq and in different areas in the world, and you've been studying their way of uh, communications as well as their progress in the various conflicts at hand. Uh, give us a little bit of an understanding. Do you see uh, a clear divide between the different countries, between the different groups? Well, I think there is a clear divide. Uh, and coming and further on from what Ofra was, was just telling us, I think that today we can identify really two rival movements, each of which would see itself as the kind of natural leader of the entirety of mm -hmm. Kurdish national uh, enterprise or hope. Two very, very different movements, different, as different as, as could be imagined. Mm -hmm. And these are firstly the, the Kurdish Democratic Party or KDP of, um, of Masoud Barzani, President Masoud Barzani mm -hmm. of the KRG in Iraq, which is essentially the ruling, which is the ruling authority in northern Iraq today in, in what looks more and more like a de facto state uh, entity and what certainly has the uh, ambition to become a state uh, entity. And this is a pro-business, uh, very traditional uh, conservative, sometimes quite religious uh, group of people. Mm -hmm. And rival to them, you have the movement of PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, uh, founded in the late uh, 70s in Turkey, which then began on struggle against the Turks in 1984 by Abdullah Ocalan and a group of his friends. This is a movement that emerges from the milieu of the Turkish Kurdish radical left of the 1970s, with all that that implies. In other words, a fiercely uh, secular movement, a socialist movement in its orientation. And these two movements each see themselves as the natural leaders of the entirety of Kurdish uh, nation. Each of them has kind of small franchises in each of the various areas where Kurds are situated. And as a result, unsurprisingly, as we see in many other national movements at this kind of stage of their development, there is a very, very deep rivalry between the two, a complete inability at the present time to unite, even though to many outsiders it seems frustrating and absolute common sense. Why can't the Kurds unite at this crucial moment? They can't. Two very different movements, each of them doing well in its own way, but showing no signs at the present time, I think, of moving towards unity with the other. Minister Owen. Um, over the uh, last uh, week or so, the um, US-led coalition in Iraq and in Syria against uh, ISIS um, has been commanded by a new Lieutenant General, um, Stephen Townsend. He took over from uh, Sean McFarland. And his very first uh, statement was that he is going, uh, during his watch, which wasn't specified in time, but the next several months, he is going to uh, try and take over both Mosul in Iraq and Raqqa, the capital of ISIS in Syria. Now, he needs the Kurds, at least for Mosul, perhaps also for Raqqa. The problem is that these two, not Mosul and Raqqa, but these two uh, oil cities, Kirkuk and Mosul, uh, heavily influenced by the Kurds and close to the uh, Kurdish region, lie outside of the boundaries of the Kurdish region. The Kurds will probably take over Mosul and perhaps also Kirkuk, and we might see an Iraqi Kashmir, because if Iraq disintegrates into various regions, Sunni, Shiite, uh, and Kurdish, or perhaps just the Kurdish region and all of the rest, they will fight over this oil-rich uh, province. Uh, Mosul is, is in uh, Ninwe province, which is not part of, of the uh, uh, Kurdish uh, uh, regional government. And uh, there will be no end uh, to fighting because 
this is the main bone of contention between the Kurds and the uh, Baghdad government. Who gets what part of the oil revenues? But uh, how how uh, uh, much tax do you pay to the federal government? So even if uh, we are rid of ISIS, the problems uh, will go on. Uh, Professor Banjo, when we're looking at uh, the reality at hand in Syria, and we'll specify now in Syria, uh, there is a group called the YPG, the YPG, and they have and been... And the YPJ also. YPJ, which, which, is, which is a bit women. smaller, but yeah, yeah, uh, at the same time, absolutely. Women are important in this field. I agree. Uh, YPG, however, has uh, the most significant gains in recent months when it comes to various cities. Just now they have, of course, uh, captured um, uh, Manbaj, which is the most significant strategic loss in, in recent months for the Islamic State when it comes to a border city with Turkey, uh, a city which has seen a lot of foreign fighters enter Syria through it and has also uh, been very rich when it comes to the trade capabilities of the Islamic State. Of course, on the other hand, you have Turkey, which is uh, not a big friend of the YPG and considers it as a terrorist organization, warning it to leave the city or else some uh, attacks will happen from the Turkish side, even though it's a U.S.-led coalition-backed organization. So how does this actually play hand-in-hand hand when the Kurds are actually in between two uh, different forces right now, they, they need to consider the next moves. Yeah, this is complicate the whole situation, especially as the Russians and the Americans are involved in the situation. And maybe it's uh, interesting to know that the Kurds managed to have the support of both the Russians and the, and the Americans. We have seen the Americans uh, bombarding even in Hasake where there was uh, some clashes. There were clashes between the Kurds and the, for the first time uh, between the Syrian, the Syrian regime. regime, and there they had the support. Now they are having almost 90% of Hasake, which is again a very red uh, line, uh, light for the for the Turkey. But in my opinion, Turkey is now as um, will concentrate mainly on attacking its own PKK because it cannot fight on two fronts at the same time. And what's going on in Turkey is really a kind of. Uh, uh, annihilation of uh, of many places of Kurdish places. So, Turkey might you know try to threaten the YPG, but in my opinion, they will not go into the fighting because of the Americans, and because also they have um, to to care for the you know for the ISIL or the Islamic State. So they have so many uh, so many problems to to mm -hmm. solve. So I don't know if they will go straight and in, enter into Syria in order to fight. Dr. Spire, let's take a few months backwards when still we had the talks in Geneva with regard uh -huh. to the uh, UN-led negotiations on finding some kind of resolution during which there was also a cessation of hostilities implemented in Syria. At that time, prior to those negotiations, we had Turkey refusing to be part of those negotiations if the YPG, the Kurdish mm -hmm. groups in Syria, would be part of it, defining it as a terrorist organization, a move actually frowned upon by Moscow, as well as the United States behind closed doors, of course. But uh, if we really pinpoint the situation in Syria, the Kurds are currently possessing the second largest piece of land in Syria after the Islamic State, and are capable of maintaining that piece of land under its control with all the weaponry and the backing that it's got at the moment. Does this mean that Turkey will not agree to a resolution in the future, if such a resolution would come about, where the Kurds will have a significant piece of land within Syria? I think that Turkish policy in recent days, the very interesting developments in Turkish policy following the meeting between President Erdogan and President Putin of Russia and the rapprochement apparently between, uh, you know, between Russia and Turkey after some very difficult relations is led not least by the Turkish determination, stated determination, to prevent the emergence of an autonomous ethnic Kurdish enclave inside Syria. It appears that the Turks have genuinely set that as, as some kind of, I wouldn't say red line, but certainly as an objective absolutely to be worked to to prevent. Mm -hmm. And I think that the uh, Turkish uh, reconciliation with the uh, Russians and therefore 
so to speak, with also with the Assad regime and with Iran to some degree, I say the allies of the Russians, is to some degree probably underlying the fact that the Assad regime then chose to act so aggressively for the first time against the Kurdish enclave mm-hmm. in Hasaka in recent days. These things appear to me to be without doubt uh, connected. I think broader Turkish policy also is dictated by these needs. Let's, let's not forget that the Kurds now control the greater part of that very long 800 kilometer border between Syria and Turkey. There are now two Kurdish enclaves. There was three, but the Kurds united two of them. So Jazeera and Kobani now united. Then you have an area controlled by mm-hmm. ISIS, controlled by the rebels, and then a further Kurdish enclave further west in Afrin. And the Turks understand correctly, I think, that the mm-hmm. Kurds would very much like to unite those three cantons into a single area. From a Turkish point of view, that absolutely has to be prevented. Now, the way that the Turks are currently trying to do this, it appears to to those of us looking closely at it, is by uh, developing their relations with the rebels, the remaining Sunni Arab rebels in the north of the country, with the intention that if ISIS loses that now 28-kilometer area it controls along the border, it must, from a Turkish point of view, lose it to the rebels and not to the Kurds. Losing to the Kurds, that means the unification of the border on the Kurdish side. Mm-hmm. We're looking right now, recent uh, hours literally, at the possibility being discussed or being speculated about of a rebel attack on, on uh, uh, ISIS-controlled Jarabulus mm-hmm. with the intention of making sure it's rebels who begin to roll up that ISIS-controlled area and not the Kurds. But here's the thing to remember. The rebels are a very, very weak vessel of policy for the Turks. In fact, they have not been gaining ground against ISIS in the way the Kurds have been. So Turkish policy remains a very big question of whether it will succeed. But absolutely, the Turks are determined to prevent the emergence of a Kurdish area. And of course, this corridor of 28 kilometers is a strategic area which has also some kind of of importance in the next step in Aleppo and those areas. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Owen, please. Um, Erdogan um, was faced by the need to set priorities. He would have liked uh, to have all of his enemies annihilated, but this is impossible. He wants to see Assad out. He doesn't want uh, the Kurds uh, to link up uh, with his own Kurds, but he must set priorities. And therefore, his uh, first priority is against the Kurds, because the Kurds are not only a foreign policy problem, as the Syrian regime is, it's a domestic policy. If he sees those millions of Kurds residing in Turkey, Turkish citizens, Turkish voters, Mm -hmm. Turkish parliamentarians, if he sees them as a fifth column, obviously he would like to prevent, by all means, the um, um, reinforcement of their power, the link up uh, with the um, Kurds in Syria, and therefore he might swallow the bitter pill of acquiescing with Assad's remaining in power if this is the price he has to pay in order to block the Kurds mm-hmm. in Syria. But here's the problem, because Please. the Americans has, has a different idea of how to, do, how to solve the problem in Syria, and they do not see eye to eye with Turkey about the Kurds. Mm-hmm. One fact, as we know, they are supporting the Kurds in all these operations. So Turkey has to solve its problem with the Americans first, and we don't know where Turkey is going vis-a-vis the West. But that's why it is much more, you know, a wider problem than the Kurds. And by the way, I would like to remind us that Turkey was against the KRG the, the, in, in Iraq at the time, and it had to sw- swallow the, uh, the mm. pill and to have uh, Kurdistan as it is. So we don't know if, if Turkey would send its arms to, to fight uh, in Syria. And at some point in the conflict in Syria, don't forget that Turkey has given the opportunity to the KRG to use its lands in order to get exactly. into Syria and assist mm-hmm. its right. Kurdish uh, brothers in Syria. So uh, I'd like actually to look at the connection once more. Of course, uh, Dr. Spire has referred to the significant divide between the Barazani uh, dynasty, if you will, within uh, Iraq to the PKK in Turkey, which of course influences a lot more the Syrian Kurds rather than the Iraqi Kurds. But at the same time, I'd like to uh, look at how can those two groups actually work uh, their way through when it comes to Uh, Turkey, because Turkey is still a significant player also in Iraq, and also with everything that happens there, will the economic interests or strategic interests of of the uh, Turks in Iraq mend the wounds with the Kurds living there? 
In Iraq itself? In Iraq mean, itself. No, I mean, the, in Iraq, there is strategic alliance, you can say, between the Kurds of Iraq and uh, since, nine, uh, since 2008. Then it started the alliance, and, you know, if you go to Kurdistan, all the everything is done by Tur- uh-huh. Turks, and uh, the pipelines, the oil pipelines, which uh, the Kurds have has managed to build through Turkey, this is very important, a strategic mm. asset for both the Kurds and Turkey. And even today, Barzani has gone to meet um, the president and, uh, and uh, also the prime minister in order to try and find solutions to the problem. I think he might have been go- going also to try and see how to solve the Mosul issue, which you mentioned, because there is a lot of problems between the Sunnis and the Shias and the Kurds about who is going to have Mosul and who will be, uh, you know, the one who will liberate Mosul and if the Kurds will get part of Mosul. So, in my opinion, Barzani is quite flexible in using Turkey uh, for his, uh, you know, internal domestic problems, both within the Kurdish region itself and with Baghdad and also with the uh, Syrian PKK, PYG, YPG. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Spire, your perception on the matter? Yeah, well, of course, this issue of the uh, de facto strategic alliance between the KRG and Turkey is absolutely crucial and central. And we should be aware that this, of course, also has a knock-on effect with regard to internal Kurdish relations because it is precisely the very close relations between the Turkish government and Barzani, on which, by the way, you know, Barzani can't afford to give up on them. They're absolutely crucial both to the internal workings of KIG and indeed to any ambitions the KIG may have to turn into a state within the near to, to, to medium term future. These relations have a knock on effect because, of course, with Barzani close to the uh, Turks and once again, as we've now seen for the last year, more or less a situation of all out war between the Turks and the PKK, it means that Barzani absolutely has to keep as far away from the PKK as possible. Mm -hmm. So the KRG-Turkish relationship effectively works to prevent any possibility of Kurdish national unity of the kind which we've been discussing over the last few minutes. Mm -hmm. And this has very practical effects. It means that the border area between the KRG and the Kurdish-controlled part of Syria, which the PKK now refer to as Rojava, this is the name which they have for it, is a very tense and closed border. There are by no means cordial relations between the Kurdish Peshmerga on one side of the Tigris River there and the YPG fighters on the other side. Very tense relations. That means that goods are not all the time allowed to cross over. The the Syrian Kurds are accusing the Iraqi Kurds of trying to starve them and make sure their project fails. Fighters are not allowed always to cross over. Journalists also not allowed to cross over freely to cover. So it means that this Turkish KRG alliance, whilst it's absolutely crucial for the KRG and for any interest they have to become a state, also has, I'm afraid, a very negative knock-on effect on any hopes for Kurdish Mm -hmm. unity. Uh, Mr. Ogan, I'd like actually to uh, get the connection as we have about five minutes before the end of the show, the connection between Israel and the Kurdish people. Of course, there's been uh, some kind of alliance under something called a third circle with the Kurds in Iraq. Uh, There's been, uh, uh, of course, a lot of relationships with Barzani and and his dynasty. do we see this uh, situation evolve to a, a closer, more vocal alliance uh, in, at a point also where Israel has also very strategic interests in Iraq with a lot of oil coming into Israel from those areas? And at the same time, we have also the Syrian Kurds. Uh, do we have interests there, especially now that we have some kind of uh, uh, rapprochement between Turkey and Israel? Well, Israeli officials, uh, when they um, indicate or intimate that there are more entities in addition to Egypt and Jordan uh, with uh, substantial relations, if not uh, overt, uh, peaceful relations with Israel in the region, of course, they also refer to the uh, KRG in addition to uh, some Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf countries. Now, uh, so much has happened in the region over the last quarter century that uh, so many upheavals that one has to go back to the 1991 war, after which uh, Saddam Hussein, because he stayed in power, uh, started massacring people in his country, including Kurds and the Americans uh, intervened again. There was Operation Provide Comfort, and the KRG was actually established at that time, 1992. But what we saw later in the next war, 2003, was that the KRG was for. Um, 
throwing uh, Saddam Hussein off his pedestal, while the Turks were against it. Now, regarding Israel, the difference is that when Israel helped the Kurds in Iran or in the Iranian-Iraqi border against Iraq, Israel did it for its own interests in order to pin down Iraqi divisions to that remote front so that no expeditionary force will intervene in an Israeli-Syrian war. Mm -hmm. This was in the 1960s and up until 1975 when the Iran-Iraq agreement uh, on the Shuttle Arab uh, was achieved with the support of Henry Kissinger, the Kurds were left uh, on their own and they were powerless to do anything for themselves. Nice now, nice. now it's different because now they have enough leverage of their own. Mm. Professor Benja? Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, they, they uh, we are hearing all the time, uh, Prime Minister and others, that they, they support Kurdistan independence, and I think there Israel has a stake for such a state because this is the most uh, you know reliable partner. It's pro-Western, it's uh, pro-Israeli, but you know it cannot do anything in the open. Mm -hmm. So I think at the moment, when the moment there is an independent Kurdistan, Israel will be one of the first countries, if not the first, to recognize this. And it's close enough to Iran to threaten Iran mm -hmm. because of the uh, conspiracy which the Iranian leaders will bring to fire? Well, just to, to reiterate, yeah, we're seeing both in Syria and in Iraq, Kurdish forces are the most consistently pro-Western, and they also have a habit of winning their battles. This is a very good combination. It's something which, in my opinion, the West ought to take notice of. And of course, if Kurdistan does emerge in Iraq, where I think it very probably will, even maybe in Syria or so further down the line, that should be seen as a potential asset for the West, and I would see Israel's interest as, as you know, being very much within that broader perception. Speculation for the near future on the matter? Well, the, uh, you mentioned, uh, you all mentioned uh, Masoud Barazani and the Barazani dynasty. There's also the Talabani dynasty, and it's interesting to see uh, whether there will be some form of real democracy in the KRG, or whether we are doomed to see another dynasty um, in the region like the Assad dynasty and others, and what will uh, come up? Uh, Professor Benjia, one sentence. One sentence. I think that um, Kurdistan is very close towards independence, and um, we might see it quite in the near future. Interesting. All right. Uh, Dr. Spire, are you as optimistic? Last sentence with, on the matter. With regard to Iraqi Kurdistan, I'm generally optimistic. I was there just a few months ago. I can tell you that when you land in the airport in Erbil, you have very much the impression that you are landing in something that is already an independent state with its own armed forces, its own economy, its own visa system. So it's almost there. I suspect they will get there. With regard to Syrian Kurdistan, Turkish Kurdistan and Iranian Kurdistan, well, of course, so. the way is very, very much further. Dr. Jonathan Spire, thank you so very much for coming here. Professor Ofra Bengio, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so very much. Mr. Amir Oren. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well. And we will see you next week. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.